our series. Um, funding for this project is provided by uh, New York State's Environmental Protection Fund and is administered by the Urban and Community Forestry Program in DEC's Lands and Forests. Um, for uh, today's webinar, um, we'll be governing the uh, American Chestnut Tree and the American Chestnut um, Foundation project, a restoration project. Um, our presenter is uh, Nico Nantes. He is the director of Hello. District 1 for the New York State chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, if there are any uh, questions, you can use the Q&A um, feature. Uh, we'll go over any questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Um, so please use the Q&A for any of those. Any comments or anything like that, you can use the chat feature. But any questions, please use the Q&A. Um, we will uh, be uh, taking ICA uh, CEU numbers at the end of the webinar. So if you just um, put in your name and your uh, ISA number at the end into the chat, that's how we'll be collecting those. Um, so without further ado, uh, Nico, um, I'll let you take over from here. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Nico Nances. I am the director for District 1 of the uh, New York State chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. And I will be present, I'll be presenting to you today the, well, I just call it, this is my presentation, The Return of the uh, King, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of the American Chestnut. So you may or may have not heard about this tree. I mean, for those who know the story, it's both a, it's both a tragic but also a very, uh, a very heartwarming story. So these trees were once so plentiful throughout the eastern United States at one point that in 1540, it was noted by uh, DeSoto's expedition that where there'd be mountains, there'd be chestnuts. And in many cases, that wasn't actually a lie or a uh, hyperbole, especially from like uh, Southern Georgia all the way up until even our area of Long Island. It was uh, the predominant tree species. And in some cases making up about 25% of the forest canopy. And then, and that also became more apparent when European settlers moved in, because once we actually started clearing land for our own purposes, we actually made room for these trees to actually expand even more because we found them to be very, very reliable. Now, um, American chestnuts are a very, very wonderful tree, unlike oak trees, which only produce nuts sporadically, American chestnuts produce an annual nut crop every single year, which is great because this not only makes it a very important species to um, humans, it becomes a very big keystone species to the eastern citrus forest. And it was very relied on, it was very important and it was heavily relied on by the American black bear, white-tailed deer, squirrels, blue jays, wait, I don't know if you can see the uh, photo, turkeys, and even the extinct passenger pigeon, which in many cases has been theorized to have actually subsisted, have um, had some form of uh, positive relationship with this tree as these nuts were actually small enough to fit into their throats because they were ravenous eaters. Now, for uh, us human beings, for hundreds of years, American chestnuts were relied on by the Native American tribes, which actually helped out with their uh, migration upward during the post-glacial period. And they were a really great source of lumber for Native Americans for building their homes and for the bark, which was used to also make their, work, their, uh, their shelters and all that stuff. And once uh, your, once people from Europe started to come over to the United States and also just to the New World, they heavily, they heavily relied on these massive, enormous trees. So in this picture on the top left, on the top right, you can see is from the Great Smoky Mountains National uh, Park Service, 
and it shows two lumberjacks sitting on top of two giant massive American chestnut trees. One thing you have to remember is that these trees were massive. They weren't like rinky dink chestnuts that you'll see from like uh, Walmart. They weren't the Chinese chestnuts, Chinese chestnuts that looked more like an apple tree. These trees were wild behemoths that could grow up to over 120 feet tall and have a diameter of excess over 10 feet. They were massive trees, and that's when you just left them alone and let them grow. Now, the great thing about these trees was they had a highly rot resistant wood. It was more durable than oak. It was highly profitable, which made them a very, very, very essential lumber source for lumberjacks for hundreds of years, up until the beginning of the 20th century, which I'll get into later. And aside from that, they were heavily relied on because, as you can see below you, chestnuts. Although they're tiny, about maybe the size of this little hole, they're very, they're not even bigger than like a quarter in some cases. What they lack for in size, they make up for in taste and in quantity. Because these trees were massive, they could produce tons of nuts. And the other thing is, they were, compared to other chestnuts, were the most highly recommended chestnut to eat on the face of the planet and still are to this day. And actually, many uh, chestnut growers actually combine American chestnuts with other trees in order to improve their uh, crop yields taste. Now, um, how do you produce chestnuts and how do they actually even get formed? So usually you have on the, uh, the top left screen, every summer around, even on Long Island, between June through the month of July, these beautiful flowers pop out from the trees. So what you're seeing in front of you is the catkins and the burrs. Now catkins are these long white flowers. Those are the male flowers. And what you do is, what is done naturally is if you have two chestnuts, which is how they pollinate, because they're not self-pollinating, the catkins from one tree have all their pollen go from that tree. And once they pollinate the actual burrs, you'll eventually have fertile nuts start forming. When you have pollen from one tree fertilizing the burr of another, which are these little green pineapple things, they end up turning into these beautiful prickly balls of just sheer pain. How do I know this? I've collected them. They may look cute, but they are painful. But once you wear gloves and open up the nuts, and they actually also open up naturally, you can see the beautiful prize on the inside, which, is, which are these deliciously amazing, beautiful tasting chestnuts. Now, prior to um, their Prior to their demise, which I'll get into later, the American chestnut had a range that, as you can see, stretched from uh, eastern Mississippi all the way up until northern Ma to southern Maine, and then to like southern Ontario, and there were tons of these trees. And this is actually a tree from South Carolina, if I'm remembering, or North Carolina, and you can see these trees were highly valuable wood were a highly valuable wood source, not only because of their uh, high uh, rot resistance due to the amount of tannin they had in their wood, which made them very reliable and resourceful as long lasting pieces of uh, timber, but they were very awe inspiring because they were the redwoods of the east. They were massive, they grew tall, and they towered most, most individuals that came before them. You can even see here in this old etch drawing that was made in the 1800s, sorry. Ah, uh, felt better. Aha, so this guy over here, he's throwing chestnuts down to the locals down below. And you can see in some cases, they didn't have to have a timber form like the one in the middle right here, I'm pointing to, but they could also have giant outward expanding branches. So it really depends from one tree to another, but American chestnuts were very, very, highly profitable and very wonderful trees to have, not only for wildlife, but for people. Now, aside from that, 
these trees all these are more or these are actually more old photos that I found on the internet and you can also find them here you can also find them anywhere too oh sorry that these trees were very massive and I just wanted to show you how large these trees were in comparison to the people and you can see that um, so for the tree on the top left hand side it's there's three men right in front of one single massive chestnut tree and then uh, in some cases these trees so especially like the guy right here on the top right hand side he might be about my height six feet this tree towers over him like a like a guy next to an ant they're massive and you can even see there are other photos at the bottom that you have like a family of a family of six and they're still puny in comparison to these massive trees and for hundreds of thousands of years this was the norm of the uh, ecological system of the united states and then by the time of uh the 1900s these trees really were the predominant species because even after uh, the decimation of most of our forests a lot of these trees were propagated and actually were basically um, grown very vigorously because they not only were a high, highly valuable wood source, they were just wonderful trees. They were a great shade tree, they were a great uh, fruit nut crop, and many people just absolutely loved them. However, we did something quite terrible, and what was considered unthinkable at the time, but even today, especially if you've heard of the giant uh, Japanese Asian, uh, Asian uh, wasp, we have some unattended, uh, unattended consequences that we didn't think about. So, this guy is the chestnut blight, also known as Kyphonectra parasitica, which is called chestnut blight because most people find it easier to pronounce. Now, yeah, um, do, 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 do. as you can see, around 1904 and as early. And even on Long Island, this actually was on Long Island, it's been recorded that around 1894, so this is a couple of years before 1904's first recorded uh, sighting in the Bronx Zoo, the American chestnut blight actually started to spread out from Long Island, the New York City area, completely outward, and over a course of 50 years, which is a minuscule amount of time when comparing it to the actual existence of this tree species. It completely expanded to completely wiping out the entire species in almost all of its entirety. And unfortunately, the reason why is this tree, unlike its Asiatic cousins, never developed a form of resistance or a form of ability to resist and be able to coexist with this fungus that happens to love eating chestnut the chestnut trees decaying matter. And unfortunately for American chestnuts, because they never coexisted with this Asiatic pest, this fungus eventually wiped it out nearly to complete utter, distinct, utter extinction. Now, so on Long Island, this could be seen very, this can be seen in a lot of great detail. So these are photos from the Pennsylvania uh, Commission of Forestry back in the 1920s, and it shows the, and it shows chestnut trees in Richmond Hill, Queens, Long Island, New York. And this is what many people had a view of in uh, many parts of Long Island, from Richmond Hill to Forest Park, in places like Port Jefferson. And this one right over here, this is from the Long Island Railroad. This is a Long Island Railroad view. And all the trees that you can see that are dead white skeletons, like these ones over here and over here prior, those are all dead American chestnuts. So on Long Island, they made up about 25% of the forest canopy. And I wanted to just paint the picture for you in this way because, well, through these photos, because a lot of people, they might not understand why it's important to restore this tree, but this is the reason why. You can see in these photos, that the entire canopy, which used to be completely healthy, strong, amazing fruit-bearing nut trees, were all but dying. 
that's a really big crushing uh, disaster for the environment. And unfortunately, it just spread further and further and the situation got so worse that, and these are actually more photos, which I can maybe get back to later. It basically led to the function, the functional, the functionally extinct uh, situation we're in right now. So unfortunately, because the species was popped up by the chestnut blight, it went from being from a population of about three to four billion American chestnuts to now being a few million, which in turn led to a massive decline in a lot of wildlife populations. People. Well, I mean, human beings, as in general, we lost a major lumber source that was highly rot resistant. We lost a major food source, a nut crop, that we could sell to market and stuff. And we basically ended up causing the species to become functionally extinct. Now, that term, which has been, uh, which was created by the American Chester Foundation, and is also used by SUNY ESF. <sighs> practically means the tree, in, although it's not totally extinct, it's function in the ecosystem as an actual necessary keystone species that holds everything together is gone. The oak trees have somewhat replaced it, but can I even do the functionality that this tree did? So the function of being a very predominant annual nut crop tree has all but been wiped out and this tree now is left as, as I will show you, regrowth stumps so if you walk down south in like uh south carolina and stuff or in virginia or even uh walk in the woods where i go you can actually still find a lot of these old dead stumps because the tannin happens to help these stumps uh be preserved and another cool thing about chestnut trees they are they are amazing coppice trees and in some cases if you uh coppice a a dying chestnut in a field plot, they can grow up to about six to seven feet tall within a span of one growing season. So these trees have managed to survive because the root systems don't die from the blight because microbes in the soil protect them. So for the past hundred years, these few million stragglers of this once mighty species have survived because, well, soils helped them has helped keep their root system alive but uh unfortunately because these trees don't really get up to the canopy they will eventually eventually die out because they can't get they cannot get enough energy all the time from the sunlight which then leads to um the eventual decay of the root systems eventually those root stock the root stock that the tree needs to regrow will let you die so these two photos I believe, the sort of two photos that I have here, these are from trees that I found on Long Island. So, and aside from that, you'll have, you'll see a few photos of giant, amazing American chestnuts, and you think, oh, the trees aren't gone, they're still here. However, these are the last of a few remaining giants that have managed to survive because they, are, they were planted either well outside of the natural range of the American chestnut, like in Washington State or in Oregon, or these are trees that have managed to survive because they're lucky. The chance they have natural, natural resistance is about zero. Like literally, it's, there's really no chance they had some form of natural resistance with the way they were eliminated. And here are some more photos of some epically beautiful large trees. And you can see here that even these small, even these, uh, survivors that are still hanging on by a thread still grow up to pretty massive sizes if they get lucky enough. Now, the awesome thing is, in 1983, a new hope arose. After years and years of failed experimentation and failed um, and really bad uh, restoration efforts, the American Chestnut Foundation was born. Now, so in 1983, the American Chestnut Foundation was established in order to bring back this tree back to its former glory as the uh, king of the Eastern Deciduous Forest. They're a nonprofit organization, which I actually still donate money to, and 
they're split up into their own individual state chapters, which are all determined to meet up with the same goal of restoring this tree back to what it used to have. It's a uh, necessary ecological ecological niche in the ecosystem. And there are two programs in order to restore this tree. The first one is called back cross breeding. So the idea was initially, because uh, before there was a real, real true awesome advancements in uh, genetic uh, engineering and also in uh, just uh, genetics in general, um, we also had this idea that you can genetically restore the American chestnut by just back cross breeding it with Chinese chestnuts. So in this example from the American Chestnut Foundation's back cross breeding program, the first generation was half American, half Chinese. And with each generation afterward, you outcross it with, them with uh, more American chestnuts to regain the Americanness of that tree until you have a 15th, 16th American chestnut in the BC3, F3 generation at the very bottom, which would be mostly American, but would have a tiny percentage of the Chinese chestnut's genes in order to give it resistance. Unfortunately, recently, this has proven to be maybe not the best course of action because they realized through genetic research, Chinese chestnuts have 12, have like maybe around nine to 12, I'm being modest, chromosomes that actually relate to light tolerance. That's a lot of genes and a lot of chromosomes to use. And unfortunately, if you're back cross breeding, you might actually lose those genes along the way. And that's not a matter of if, it's a matter of, it's just a matter of life, it's going to happen. So that problem has come up so much so that they actually realize a lot of the trees that are blight resistant are more Chinese than American, which is a big problem. However, there's another hope. Dun, 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 dun. The Transgenic American Chestnut Program, brought to you by SUNY ESF. Now, um, back in the 1990s, uh, a man by the name of Herb Darling decided to call up to genetic uh, plant genesis, Dr. Charles Maynard, who is on the left, and Dr. Bill Powell, who is on the right. And he asked them, is there a way you can actually genetically alter the genome of the American chestnut so we can actually restore the species without uh, back cross breeding it and to actually speed up the process? And they're like, well, let's do it. And over the past 30 years, because this is the 30th anniversary, whoop, whoop, uh, <laughs> they've managed to actually do that. Through trial and error, the New York State chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation, which has been the number one donor to this program, has been able to create the first ever light resistant American chestnut through introducing a gene from wheat called oxidase. And I want to point to your attention this little picture down below. What you can see here is canker assays. So the trees on the left-hand side are the actual control tests. So the first one is a purebred American chestnut, which unfortunately has died from the blight. And you can see the, 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 the necrosis on the American chestnut. You can see the Chinese chestnut, which is not dying from the blight. And you can see it has very little necrosis. And then you have the, uh, the darling transgenic American chestnut events that they created. And you can see necrosis has been limited to basically not even being apparent on these trees. Why? Because the oxide oxidase detoxifies the acid that the fungus makes and turns it into H2, uh, H H2O and CO2, which not only are amazing compounds for this tree to live, this also means that the blight, instead of killing the tree, becomes a saprophyte, meaning it lives off of dead matter. If you want to learn how they did this, here we go. First, in the beginning, what they had to figure out was, how do you genetically alter the tree? 
And unfortunately, American chestnuts take a long time because they're very, very hard to genetically alter. I'm sorry I'm moving around. I'm just trying to show you all the pictures I have. So first they had to dissect a pubescent embryo American chestnut. Then with agrobacterium, which is this beautiful little um, genetic editing uh, bacterium that is found in nature, which actually is the reason why we have sweet potatoes today. What they did was they trained this agrobacterium to only insert the genes they wanted. And what they did was they inserted the gene oxidase into this plasmid bacterium we call agrobacterium. Once that happened, they would, they would then put these embryos in, a, in their own little growth chambers and just let them grow over the course of a few weeks. And what you would get after uh, the few things, which took them forever to do, which isn't their fault, it's called the trees are very, very, very picky and are very hard to actually grow from embryo, unlike them being grown through roots and from nuts in general, you'll get these little baby shoots. And once you have the shoots, you then grow them, you then separate some of those shoots and put them in a rooting hormone and then put them in soil. And once that happens, you'll have a little baby tree that starts to grow. And once from there, and once they finally become acclimatized and actually able to withstand uh, the elements and are able to actually live without the need of uh, high amounts of humidity, you put them in the greenhouse and then you can plant them in the field. And what you can see here, this is the big, awesome tree that everyone is talking about, Darling 54. And what you can see is unlike the non-transgenic American chestnuts on the left-hand side, they're still alive. And these are awesome light-resistant essay tests showing that these trees are not only proven to be tolerant to this fungus, but they're actually more tolerant than their Asiatic Chinese chestnuts, which is where we got this blind in the first place. So, one thing I want to clear up. They're not funded by Montesano. The majority of the money actually comes from people like you and me. Just average state people giving money. And yes, Montesano gave a tiny amount, but this is how much they gave. Tiny, tiny. Very tiny. So, one, the amount of money they, that Montesano gave is neg negligible. And SUNY ESF has more or less gotten more money from just. Uh, public donors like you and me over the past 30 years, then they've gotten donations from other big corporations. And the great thing about this tree is it's not patented. They never had the intention to patent it, nor anything else. Why? Because this tree is a restoration tree. It's not some hokey pokey tree that you're going to plant in your yard like, yo, this is my new uh, tree I bought from SUNY SF. Yay. No, it's a tree that's meant for restoration. They want it to be out there for people when it's meant for restoration, that's it. Also, if you read some of the anti-GMO papers that they've written about this tree, please don't read them. Don't trust them. They are highly, there's a proper word for this. They are unreliable. And a lot of their points and the reasons they try to stop these trees from actually wanting to be they're trying to stop these trees from being approved by the regulators is because they think if this goes through, then big GMO is going to have a foot in the door and cause all, mayhem, all kinds of mayhem and havoc, which isn't true. These trees are perfectly safe. They've done a boatload of tests to actually prove that these trees are safe. And they're doing this through the, through the gaze of through these regulators the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA. Why? Because this tree, and I want to show you this beautiful poster that they actually uh, made that shows you all the tests. They want to make sure that this tree not only is not going to be a pest in the environment that's going to cause mayhem and havoc, but they want to actually restore this tree. But they also want to make sure this tree is going to be safe. So they've done everything from leaf assays to um, 
fungi in the soil to um, leaf decay, uh, tadpoles and vernal pools, the transgene inheritance, um, bumblebee pollination, and a whole bunch of other amazing things, including insect um, insects eating uh, the plant matter in general. And what they've proven is that this tree has no ecological risk impacts on the environment, which is great. So, yay, we're back. Okay, here we go. And aside from this, if you're wondering how I got started, I watched the TEDx uh, de extinction video on this uh, amazing group. And ever since, I've been uh, loving this little job I've been doing. So these are photos of what I've been doing so far. I've not only collected American chestnuts from wild type chestnuts like this one that I actually am posing up against next to from uh, Old Bethpage Restoration Village, which is in Nassau County. I've also been growing these trees from seed, which is, if any of you want to try, it's a very humbling experience. And not only, uh, not only makes sure everything puts everything into much more, um, in a much more humbling perspective. It also makes you just humbled and humbled in general because it's just such an interesting, beautiful um, miracle just to see this actually, uh, to see these little trees actually grow from seed and they're like little kids to me sometimes, <laughs> most of the time anyway. So if you're wondering, what can I do to help out? My advice to you is, Sign up with the American Chestnut Foundation. It's a very simple process. You can click on this. I mean, I can show you. You can actually click on this link. You can actually sign up on their website. And you can uh, sign, if you want to do uh, just an ordinary $40 donation to actually uh, become a member, then you can do that. Oh, oh dear. Hold up, hold the phone, hold the phone. What have I done? Jeez. Oh, there we go. Yay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, you can sign up with the American Chestnut Foundation. You can also go find trees. I mean, they're not all going to be this ginormous or this big, like um, what this person has found and stuff that, he's, that these two people have found. But you can go find, you can go look for American Shazza trees and find them in order to actually help um, bring in more genetic diversity into the new chestnut, to also bring back more genetic uh, diversity in the chestnut population once we have these uh, new seedlings be approved by the USDA, EPA, and FDA. You can also uh, I you can also learn how to, learn how to identify American chestnuts, which uh, if you if if any of you want to ever learn, I can also send you links in the description here in the future. And you can also learn how to pollinate, and you can also pollinate and collect chestnuts if you can. There's a lot of things you can do. I mean, there's so many things you can do, and on Long Island, it's still the oyster is your world because. We still have a lot of ground to cover. I have found a lot of trees in eastern Nassau County, western Nassau County, and in much of western Suffolk, but there's still a lot of places I personally have not explored yet, so I need all your help. And I also wanted to put out there that um, I've actually been collaborating with Save the Great South Bay and a bunch of other organizations to help grow more American chestnut trees, which is my other next point. If you want to grow American chestnut trees, get in contact with Alan Nichols, who would gladly give you chestnuts. This year hasn't been the greatest when it comes to chestnut growing, but that's okay. And I wanted to point out that um, there's a lot of things you can do to help this program. And if you want to join, by all means, come down and join. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, you, you can ask me now. And I'm, so this project, so this project is being done through the New York City chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation, 
I'm director of District 1, and I work along with CTOC, Environmental Association, Save the Great South Bay, and the American Chestnut Foundation, which I've actually said before. So if any of you have any questions that you would like to ask, please ask me and feel free. I'm right here, and I would love to hear your questions. So that's it. Uh, Okay, we have a few questions on the chat. Kevin, um, you there? Yeah, um, thank you, Nico, for that presentation. Um, so we have one question here that says, are there any alive? And if so, are they are still susceptible to this fungus and insects? So as I said before in the presentation, I, uh, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear enough. So for American chestnuts, there are a large number of them that are still alive. There are about like maybe a few million now out there out of the three or four billion that used to be. And they're not, they're not resistant to the chestnut blight. They are still susceptible. And the reason being is because they never coexisted with this fungus before, they never had a chance to evolve over the course of 50 million years to actually resist this fungus. If the fungus was already here 15 million years ago when they first were evolving, then they would have resistance. However, because this fungus actually wiped out these trees almost nearly completely, you still have a lot of survivors still hanging on by a thread. You can still find them everywhere in the forest, even here in Long Island. If you go to Sunil Westbury, which I can also guide people around, you'll find hundreds of these root growth stumps, but they grow no bigger than maybe a small toy dog or something like that because they get killed by a blight at a very young age. And the thing that's really keeping them alive is the rootstock. So to answer your question, there's still a lot around, but just very susceptible. And you don't really see a lot of large trees that often. Okay. Um, yeah, that one might've gotten asked before you kind of covered it in the uh, presentation. Um, so we have another one here. Uh, can you give us a list of Suffolk County locations to best search for the tree? So if you want to look for uh, trees in Suffolk County, I recommend um, Stony Brook University, um, Shomick Preserve out in uh, Shelter Island. I've yet to go there, but there used to be a lot of big trees in that area. Um, Port Jefferson should have a lot of trees. Um, I actually have a map here. Just give me a moment. I actually, uh, if you all want to join, uh, the, the, if you, if any of you have iNaturalist, there's a Long Island American Chestnut Hunt group chat that's being, uh, brought to you by not only myself, but also the members of Save the Great South Bay. And we've set this up to actually locate and identify American chestnut trees across the range on Long Island because uh, we haven't really had a great time of mapping them out in the recent uh, years. And we would actually like to have all your help. So if you want to learn more about where to look for these trees, you can actually go into iNaturalist, um, type in uh, Long Island American chestnut hunt, if I can find it. Um, Okay. Yeah, it should be underneath projects. Yeah, the the hunt for American chestnuts on Long Island. So a few of the places that we want people to look for is Mishomic Preserve, Tuckahoe Preserve, uh, Sears, Bellows County Park, Henry Hollow Pine Barren State Park, the Port Jefferson Sea Tucket uh, Trail, Laurel Ridge, Laurel Ridge, Sea Tuck Woods Nature Preserve, Hunts Pond Preserve, um, the Sherwood Jane House Preserve, uh, the Heather Hills State Park, Heather Hills, uh, Heather Woods Preserve, and there's a bunch of other places that you guys can actually go and search for these trees. And there's still a lot of them, not only in Suffolk County, but in Nassau County. So by all means, please go check them out it would be a really big help to me. And also identify if they have any burrs or like prickly 
um, prickly uh, uh, nut casings in the ground, which would mean that they're uh, fruit bearing. So that'd be awesome. If you look in the chat, I just sent uh, the link to the iNaturalist group. Um, so if anyone is, uses iNaturalist, um, that's the link to the group. If you're unfamiliar with iNaturalist, it's an app. Um, you can download it on uh, your phone and um, you know play around with it. It's a very useful uh, tool for documenting um, things you find in your local ecosystems. Um, someone just asked, can you elaborate on how to obtain saplings? So if you want to obtain saplings, you can email, um, you can email Alan Nichols. I can actually email, uh, Kevin, the, uh, I can actually email him right now. The, uh, the email for Alan Nichols a little bit later, but Alan Nichols is the uh, president of the New York state chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. And what you can also do is you can email either me or Alan to uh, have uh, seedlings be brought to you. Once you, uh, uh, if you send an email, we, we will gladly send you uh, nuts or seedlings to you as soon as we can. And um, you can either pick them up at my house or you can have uh, Alan Nichols actually um, send you a package of sprouting American chestnuts from uh, upstate to grow on your property. That way you'll have uh, American chestnuts ready for planting for the, um, ready for uh, pollinating once the new blight tolerant uh, transgenic trees are able to be uh, released. Yeah, I just sent uh, his email in the chat as well. Um, so it's there for anyone that uh, would like it. Um, yeah, he'll, he'll um, mail you 10 uh, saplings. Um, and he'll he'll let you know when when he's sending them out. Okay, I have uh, for people growing the chestnuts. Are they growing them to send them back into uh, the American Chestnut Foundation? Um, I mean, when we're growing the nuts, we're growing them so we can actually just plant them in either the wild or at a public park. It's not necessarily we're growing them to send them back to the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, usually for me, we have an annual fall meeting every year for the state chapter. And what I do is I just bring a bag of nuts I've collected from the woods that fall. I just bring it to them. And that's how I actually go about giving them more genetic diversity for their, uh, for their chestnut restoration program because then you know the genetic uh, resources that they can get because the new transgenic trees, they're not, uh, they're, they're all clones. So you need the most genetic diversity you need for restoration. So that's uh, how we do it. But usually back to your question, it's more or less when you're um, growing these trees, it's not, it's not supposed to be you give them back to the Chestnut Foundation. You're growing them so once you have them planted and ready to go, um, for uh, when the new black tolerant trees are released, you can pollinate the black tolerant trees with the new, with these uh, new growing non-tolerant American chestnuts. That way you can actually produce blight tolerant seeds. And the great thing about that is half of the, uh, half of the, half of the offspring of these two trees will be blight resistant. So yeah, which is good. And uh, it's been proven to be really effective when it comes to uh, chestnut restoration. So I'll be, I said, I'm um, looking very forward to that. Are the chestnuts, are chestnuts good to plant anywhere or do they prefer a specific soil type? So chestnuts love to be planted in, in, a, in very acidic soils that are well drained. So if you plant them in a marsh or in a swamp, they'll just end up dying because they don't like to be overwatered. However, if you plant them by like maybe the side of maybe a lakeshore where you have a nice amount of drainage and the soil isn't like muddy or goopy and it's nice and actually firm and well drained, 
or in the woods or in an area where you know the soil is going to be nice, acidic, but also very well drained, they will grow very nicely. And there, and as I said before, they love a low acidic pH type soil. And they've actually been proven to grow even even uh, more vigorously if you plant them in uh, reclaimed uh, coal mines in Appalachia, which has been done by the American Chestnut Foundation because all the toxins and the acids in the soil actually make these trees grow a lot more uh, vigorously. So to answer your question, if you plant them in a somewhat uh, well-drained, uh, high acidic soil count region, that's perfect. And um, I mean, you can easily do that in many parts of Long Island, especially in the, the main interior where the moraine is. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you know Farmingdale State College, if, if there's any uh, chestnut trees there? Oh, I mean, definitely there are American chestnut trees at Forming, Formingdale State College. I've actually uh, explored there, maybe not to all of its entirety, but you will actually go, you can walk through the woods there and you'll see tons of American chestnut trees. So there are, there's n no doubt in my mind that you can find chestnut trees there and I live like only 10 minutes away at least. So I've, I've done this before. And I mean, honestly, if, uh, I mean, you can find these trees almost anywhere on that campus. So go, good luck and props to you if you find more. All right. I think that's everything. Um, are there any last questions? Don't see any. Oh. All right. Thank you once again, Nico. Um, like I said in the beginning, uh, if you're looking to get CU credits, please put your name and uh, number into, I say number into the chat. Um, we'll be having another presentation next week um, on life cycle planning and uh, wood utilization for urban trees. Uh, that will be given by Mike Cole Gavin Galvin from uh, Save a Tree and the Baltimore Wood Project. Um, so that should be a pretty interesting one. Uh, please take a look, uh, Google the Baltimore Wood Project for some more information. They do really interesting stuff. Um, if you uh, need um, to get in contact with Nico, um, you can get in touch with me or Nico, you want to provide your email for anyone that wants to uh, get in contact with you. Yeah, sure. No problem. All right. Um, all right. And yeah, so we'll have uh, two. Uh, we have a few more after um, the one next week. We'll be covering uh, tree inventories and management plans on uh, May 28th. Uh, June 11th, we'll have um, Dan Gilrain and uh, Marjorie Daughtery from Cornell Suffolk covering tree pests and diseases. Uh, and we have a, another uh, one on June 3rd in the works, Andy Hillman, he'll be covering uh, promoting tree growth in urban areas. Um, so those will be on our website, ccnasa.org slash events. Um, where you can register. When you're registering, please don't forget to uh, click on the Zoom link in the email you get to register for the Zoom webinar. All right. So if that's everything, uh, I guess we'll end the presentation. Andrea? All right. Oh, uh, wait, hold up. Um...